Good afternoon, everybody. This afternoon, we're looking at the latest developments in the financial reporting and accounting world. And we're trying to get ready for 30 June 2015, which is just a few days away. So in our webinar today, we'll be covering eight areas. First of all, we'll, we'll start with the more important stuff, the things that will impact us um, earliest or soonest. Um, the first section is the new mandatory accounting standards for 30 June 2015. And then the second area, which is important, is what is ASIC focusing on for 30 June 2015? They've issued um, their focus areas earlier in the month, and we just look at that. Then in section three, we look at some corporate governance developments, and very specifically, the new Appendix 4G that's required to be lodged um, by listed entities. In Section 4, we talk about the new audit report. Now, that is not for 30 June 2015. However, I think it's really important that auditors and clients start the conversation about what this new audit report will have to include um, and, and, and start the discussions early, and, and especially for clients to get their head around that. Then in Section 5, we look at the new AASB 15, revenue from contracts with customers. Therefore, if you're a for-profit entity, um, what does um, AASB 15 require you to do around revenue recognition? And in Section 6, we look at not-for-profit entities. So there's an ED out on the application of AASB 15, potentially, to not-for-profit entities, and we'll look at that. In Section 7, we look at the new AASB 9. I have to say we look at it very briefly um, because application date is really a number of years away or mandatory application date. And in Section 8, I would like to give you an update on the leases project. Um, now, the leases project, we don't have the new standard yet. We expect it by the end of the year, um, but, you know, uh, and the way the standard setters are going, it might be early next year, and then application date will be a few years away, I would guess three, four years away. So that's the order in which we'll be looking at the latest developments today. If at any stage you've got a comment or a question, please send it to me in the question box, which is on your right-hand side. Um, if I don't get time to read your question, respond to your question during the presentation, I'll do that afterwards. Um, so before we start, let's check whether everybody know where the question box is, and, and I'll start with a question to get us going. So my question is, what country did Australia beat to reach the upcoming quarterfinals in the Women's Soccer World Cup? So what country did Australia beat? to go through to the quarterfinals. I have to say I was quite shocked when I heard about the pay difference between the Australian women's soccer players and uh, the men. Um, quite a bit of a shock, a shock. Oh, a number of people have this right. Um, fantastic. Keep it coming. F fantastic. Most people have it right. Uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, you are right, it's Brazil, all right? So uh, uh, if you like soccer, if you like women's soccer, something for you to watch over the weekend. So let's start with the new mandatory accounting standards for 30 June. Now, you know, it's great excitement. We're going to start with new mandatory accounting standards just to say that for for-profit entities, there's really nothing. Um, the only thing we've got is the annual improvements project, which are non-urgent but necessary uh, amendments. It's minor clarifications and corrections to accounting standards. Um, for 30 June 2015, there are two annual improvement projects that come into play. Uh, they do it in cycles. They put three years together. So the 2010 to 2012 cycle is, uh, is mandatory applicable 30 June 2015, as well as the 2011 to 2013 cycle. You would ask, why does it take that much time? Because they prepare, um, you know, these annual improvements can relate to any standard. 
so it could amend 10, 15, 20 standards. Um, and then it goes out on an exposure draft, they wait for comments and then the final thing comes out and then they have to give us time to get ready. Um, so that's why we're looking at those two cycles. Um, I went through those annual improvements documents. Um, nothing, as I said, it's minor clarifications. Examples are minor changes to the definition of a related party and some changes around recognition and measurement of um, contingent consideration if you've got a business combination, um, etc. So really um, not much for for-profit entities. For not-for-profit entities, um, this year, if you've got a 30 June year end, would be the first time that you would be applying AASB 10, the new definition of control. Um, the new AASB 11 on joint arrangements and the new AASB 12 on disclosure of interest in other entities. That's the disclosure requirements um, around subsidiaries, joint arrangements and associates and in obviously also the annual improvements project. I know most not-for-profits have their year in 31 December, therefore they would have applied it 31 December 2014. Um, if you're a not-for-profit and you are wondering how does the new definition of control uh, impact us, uh, Appendix E to AASB 10 contains specific examples of the application of the new definition of control to not-for-profits. So Appendix E has been developed in Australia for Australia for not-for-profit um, entities. So that's a, a good document to look at. Uh, the not-for-profit entities, the kind of things we're looking at is if you've got a school um, and the school also have a building fund or scholarship fund um, or uh, another not-for-profit or sport club that's um, also got other funds and let's say the board of directors of the school and the scholarship fund um, are the same and ultimately the school benefit from the scholarship fund or from the building fund, uh, the question is, you know, does the school control that fund, that building fund, that scholarship fund? Um, so those are the kind of situations where we'll have to be careful and consider the new definition of control because the new definition control um, do not look at percentage interest or shareholding or voting rights. So in the old days, as soon as you got more than 50% of the shares, voting rights, etc., you've got control. And therefore, we've assumed if it's 50% or less, you don't have control. Now, that assumption is not right anymore. Uh, we're now looking at uh, do the, um, the school, for example, have the power uh, to influence variable returns from that fund. Um, so no, the, it's a whole new definition of control. I think the big change, however, if you're a for-profit or not-for-profit, a big change is the discount rates that we have to use um, to determine our provision for long service leave. Now, this change is not as a result of a change to an accounting standard. And nothing has changed in AASB 119 employee benefits. However, in the past, uh, we said that we don't have a deep market for high quality corporate bonds in Australia. And therefore, when we've determined or calculated our long service leave liability, we used government bond rates. Now, the Milliman report, which is um, dated in April or issued in April, um, which was, um, you know, Milliman was um, contracted or commissioned um, by the G100, the Group of 100 and the Actuaries Institute of Australia, to actually to consider whether in Australia we've got a sufficiently observable deep and liquid market in high quality corporate bonds. Because if you say, yes, there is a deep market for high quality corporate bonds, then you have to use the high quality corporate bond rate to determine your long service leave liability and not the corporate bond rate. Um, so they came out with their report in April and they said, yes, there is a relatively deep market for high quality corporate bonds. Um, and therefore, specifically to our picture partner staff, our long service leave calculator 
our Excel model, um, we will no longer use government bond rates, but it will have to be high quality corporate bonds that go in there. Um, the other thing a lot of people have been asking, so where do we get a high quality corporate bond rate? Um, they have said that um, a group of 100 discount rate curve will be regularly produced by Milliman and will be available as a transparent central reference point for the industry to use on an ongoing basis. And the first curve will be available in June 2015. And um, now the first curve that I've seen was issued in May and, and I, I keep my eyes open for the, the update. So important implications is that Australia now has a deep high quality corporate bond market when we discount our employee benefit liabilities, for example, long service leave, we have to use this high quality corporate bond rate at reporting date. Now, a high quality corporate bond rate, I would assume, would be higher than a government bond rate. Um, and therefore, one would expect, because we discount with that higher rate, one would expect uh, the expense and the liability to be lower. As some people have already asked me, what would the accounting treatment be? We'll treat this as a change in accounting estimate. Uh, so we'll change it in the current year and prospectively. Um, we will not restate comparative years. So the discount rates to determine your long service leave liability, um, or even if you've got other long-term employee benefits, like a def defined benefit plan, this is the, the, the bond rates that you should be using. So that's the biggest change, and it's not a change in the accounting standard. Um, if we move on to Section 2 and we look at the ASIC focus areas for 30 June, um, and it's just my wicked sense of humour, so it's not ASIC, the runners, which I really love, or, or I, sh I should say, which I used to love when I used to run, because these days all I do is run after children. And I, I'm no longer doing proper running like the old days. Um, so the ASIC focus areas for 30 June, uh, first of all, they said they are focusing on any number that would require an accounting estimate. Now, <laughs> you know, that really is most of the financial statements these days um, because accounting estimation is has become a part of financial statements. Um, specifically, they did highlight impairment testing. So there's a lot of assumptions and professional judgment required to do impairment testing and absolutely a focus. And um, I'll show you later that ASIC has also issued an impairment guide for directors and audit committees and says, you know, if you're a director and audit committee, you have to do the impairment testing. Here is a document issued by ASIC to assist you. Um, so, which is good for auditors, um, that ASIC is saying, listen, it's not the auditor's main responsibility, first of all, it's directors. Um, and the other thing that they're focusing on when they look at accounting estimates is asset values, and specifically around fair values. So, fair values of investment property, if you have property, plant and equipment at fair value, financial instruments at fair value, again, we need assumptions, um, professional judgment. The second area that ASIC is focusing on is accounting policy choices. And, and they've broken it down into, first of all, off-balance sheet arrangements. Now, you would remember that ASIC has always had an issue uh, with entities entering into uh, financing arrangements, um, potentially arguing it's an operating lease, and therefore that liability would not be included in the financial statements, it would only be in the commitments note. Or the other area with off-balance sheet financing could potentially be where there are special purpose entities. We've got a special purpose entity that's on autopilot um, that incur expenses and liabilities. We decide we don't control them because but they're on autopilot, although we ultimately benefit from them or from their research activities, and therefore we don't disclose them. So off-balance sheet arrangement continues to be an issue. Do we include all liabilities on our balance sheet? Um, revenue recognition is a focus area. 
So although there's a, it's, it's not only because there's a new revenue standard out, um, it's also on existing revenue recognition practices. Um, we, you all know that revenue is a sensitive number, often the biggest number in the financial, an indicator of growth of activity level within an organization. Um, and a, a real emphasis on do our revenue recognition policies uh, line up with the accounting standards? Um, is that what we actually apply? Um, so revenue recognition, absolutely a focus. The current standards. Um, expense deferral. So another way of saying that is, are we capitalizing development costs or intangible assets um, where they should have been expensed in the current year? Um, we, we, we capitalizing the asset this year, so therefore we defer the expenditure to future years. So expense deferral and whether we meet the criteria for capitalization as an asset, as an intangible asset specifically or as a development cost, um, do we meet those requirements? And then the fourth area around accounting policy choices are around tax accounting, specifically the recoverability of deferred tax assets. Uh, because um, we create a deferred tax liability for all uh, uh, taxable temporary differences. But when we look at deductible temporary differences, we should only include deferred tax assets on deductible temporary difference if it's probable that there will be future taxable profits against which we can um, deduct this. So tax accounting is a focus and it's a new focus. Um, it's been included for the first time in 2014 as a focus area. Another focus uh, group of, of focus areas around disclosures. So that note two, uh, which is an absolutely critical note around significant estimates and accounting policy judgments. So traditionally note one, we've got, we've got accounting policy. And then note two, what are the significant estimate judgments, assumptions made by the directors to prepare financial statements? So there I would expect to see if there were significant judgments around going concern, and um, if there's a deferred tax asset recognized or not, I would expect that the intangible assets, um, fair value of various assets. Um, useful life of assets, etc. Um, and then another key disclosure is the disclosure about the impact of accounting standards that have been issued before 30 June, but they're not yet mandatory effective. Um, so the two main examples of that is AASB 15 around revenue from contracts with customers and financial instruments. Um, as I said earlier, the leases standard has not been issued yet, so we don't have to disclose that. Um, the AASB 108 require us to disclose the new standard, uh, the key requirements of the new standard, and then also disclosure of the potential impact on the financial statements. Now, I believe, personally, because the new revenue standard and the new financial instrument standard is only mandatory applicable for 30 June 2019, which is four years away. I think it's too early to come up with a financial impact, um, unless it's quite obvious and, and you're in certain industries. Um, I think at this stage it would be good enough to say that we haven't considered the financial impact in detail. I think closer to that time, we'll be in a better position to do that. This is the document that I've talked about a bit earlier, and that is the role of, di of directors in relation to impairment testing. Now, ASIC issued Information Sheet 203 in June of this year on the impairment of non-financial assets, the role of directors and audit committees and discusses why do we have impairment testing, what is the process for assessing impairment testing, what are the common issues with impairment calculations, and questions that may be asked of external auditors. 
So to the auditors uh, attending this webinar, I think that information sheet is a great sheet to go out to your clients. I've included it in the news of the week yesterday, so you'll find a link there. Um, to the clients, I think this is a great document. You can send me an email. I can send you the link, or you can go on the ASIC website on Google, uh, ASIC Information Sheet 203, and a great information sheet on the role of directors and audit committees around impairment testing. So I think it's time for a quiz question because I want to take a sip of water. So question, in an upcoming televised interview, who does President Obama interview about his life story, climate change and the future of life on Earth? Any ideas? Let's see how you go on this one. Let's see, what do people think? <laughs> there are a few creative answers which I absolutely like. Um, the answer is Sir David Attenborough. Um, so that would be an interesting interview to watch. Uh, personally, I like President Obama. I can, I can watch his interviews. I think he's, a, he's an interesting person. Um, so I would love that. All right, so section three, corporate governance developments. Now, corporate governance developments, um, the third edition of the ASX Corporate Governance Council's corporate governance principles and recommendations have been issued recently. Um, so the third edition um, includes if not, why not disclosures. So it's saying if you're not complying with these governance principles and recommendations, you have to disclose why not. Now, the third edition is for listed entities, but as you know, that's also best practice. And quite often, um, even unlisted entities look at those as a, as a guidance on, on corporate governance. Um, so if you're a listed entity, uh, you have to look at the third edition, uh, which has been updated. Uh, if you're not complying with it, you have to disclose why not. I think the key issue or the key development here is that there's, new, there's now a requirement to lodge an Appendix 4G with the ISX. So when you lodge your financial statements, by the end of September, you have to lodge an Appendix 4E. You lodge your financial statements and you lodge an Appendix 4G. And this Appendix 4G um, would say you have to that your corporate governance um, statement um, and, and the if not, why not disclosures um, could either be on your website and then in your financial statements you disclose a link um, to the website or it could be in your financial statements. So that's another change. Uh, instead of having your corporate governance principles uh, in your financial statements, it could now be on your website. But anyway, you have to lodge Appendix 4G um, with uh, the ASX. For our staff, um, I've put a pro forma Appendix 4G on the intranet for you to access. And again, it was distributed in our news of the week yesterday. Any clients who would like to see what the new Appendix 4G looks like, please contact me directly. My email address is right at the end. Or please contact your partner or the staff that you deal with so we can send you a copy of the Appendix 4, 4G. The next section is the new audit report. Now, the new audit report, um, the proposed effective date is for financial reporting periods ending on or after 15 December next year. So if you've got a 31 December year end, it will be 31 December next year. If you've got a 30 June year end, we've got another two years. Um, internationally, the new audit report will apply to only listed entities. 
However, in Australia, we currently have an ED out and the comment date or the, the comments are due on Tuesday, the 30th of June, which asks the question, should the new audit report only apply to listed entities? Should it apply to all public interest entities, uh, which are listed entities and then some authorised deposit taking institutions? It, it depends on your number of users, etc. Um, or should it be all entities? Um, so, you know, the debate is open in, in Australia. I've attended a roundtable on this, and to me it looked like um, that most firms, accounting firms, um, are of the view that it should be listed entities or public interest entities. There were a few, they were in the minority, that thought it should apply to all entities. Now, you would ask, so what's the change? The main change is that the audit report would now include a section on key audit matters, which is a significant change from what we currently have. Currently, we would argue that the audit report should never include um, additional information to the financial statements. There will be an opinion, but no additional information. It could refer, even if there's an emphasis of matter, it would refer to a note in the financial statements. So to, for the auditor to disclose key audit matters, uh, a key audit matter are those matters that, in the auditor's judgment, were of most significance in the audit of the current period financial statements. So it's requiring the auditor to make a call. Um, so when we've done the audit, which issues were of most significance when we did the audit? Um, and, and to disclose those and how we've dealt with those. And that goes into the audit report. So potentially a user could go to the audit report, look at the areas that the auditor highlight as judgmental or where he had to work really hard or subject to auditor's judgment, and then look at the financial statements and focus on those, uh, which is a big shift from the current regime. Um, we would imagine uh, that this would require a lot of extra time of audit partners and senior audit staff uh, to document this. You can imagine it would be sensitive, exact, the exact words that are included in the audit report around key audit matters, um, that there'll have to be a discussion with the client, not only around the opinion. Um, whether it's modified, unmodified, etc., and, and what the words look like, but also what would go into the key audit matters, a disclosure. Um, I would imagine that from a firm perspective, we'll be looking at, uh, you know, uh, considering this early on, as early as our planning stage. Um, even at the planning stage, we know what would be the areas that we'll have to focus on. So key audit matters, a big change um, if you've got December year in next year, otherwise two years away. Section 5 is on the new ASB 15, revenue from contracts with customers. Now, this section, obviously I, I do not have time to cover it in depth, but I want to give you an overview of what the new revenue recognition standard is about. And the main thing is that it changes the way we talk and think about revenue recognition. Um, and it's, you know, the jury is still out to what extent it would impact the timing of revenue recognition compared to what we currently have. Um, and I think this is something that we'll have to consider earlier um, or the sooner the better, especially if you enter into long-term contracts with your customers. So a bit of an overview today, um, and I want to do this overview early, uh, um, although it's only mandatory applicable. At the moment, it says 30 June 2018, but we expect it to be deferred to 30 June 2019, because in America and internationally, it's been deferred. Um, it's not formally been deferred in Australia, but it should happen very soon. Um, so the core principle around the recognition of revenue is to depict the transfer of promised goods or services. And promised goods or services 
could be replaced with performance obligations. So recognize the revenue to depict the transfer of performance obligations to customers in an amount that reflects the consideration which the entity expects to be entitled in exchange for those goods or services that they've promised. Um, an emphasis around its promises, promised goods and services, and the amount that the entity expects. So I would circle those two concepts. So that's the core principle. There are five steps in the standard to break the core principle down. So it's a five-step approach. And I'm going to use a very simple example to try and explain the five steps. And then I'll move into each step in a little bit more detail. So my example is if we are Telstra and we are selling mobile phones to customers in a package. So you get a mobile phone and you also get airtime over 24 months. And let's say you pay $100 a month. So step one would be to identify the contracts with the customer. So step one is to think as wide as possible and bring any contract with that customer and put it on the table. So identify all the contracts that we have with this customer. So if the customer is a letter boss of all the contracts that Telstra have with a letter, a letter boss of. So that could be with me for my mobile phone, for my children's mobile phones, my husband, etc. Could also be our home phone, our Foxtel, the whole deal. So identify all the contracts with the customer, put it on the table. Step two is to identify the separate performance obligations. Now, if I think about our deal with Telstra, you know, we've got Foxtel and we've got broadband and um, we've got a home phone. And then I think we've got at this stage four mobile phones. Uh, luckily, the youngest two are still too young for mobile phones. Um, so, so that's all of that on the table. And now we identify the separate performance obligations. Um, if it was just a mobile phone contract, we would argue that one performance obligation is to give us a phone and the other performance obligation is to give us airtime or downloads over 24 months. So the two performance obligations is one, the mobile phone, and the other one is the airtime and downloads. Step three is to determine the transaction price. Now, in my example, I keep it simple. Uh, I'm going to pay $100 a month for 24 months. And I've done this recently, so I know it's fairly accurate. So transaction price, $2,400. In step four, we allocate that transaction price between the mobile phone and the airtime or the, and the downloads. And the way you do it is you go and look at a standalone selling price in the market. Now, if we say, if I go to Telstra, I have to pay, let's say, $500 for a new iPhone 6. Um, and for airtime for two years, if I just enter into that, it will cost me $2,000. So that adds up to $2,500, although my transaction price is only $2,400. So how do I split the 2,400 over the two performance obligations um, in this situation? And they say you would look at standalone selling prices in the market and you determine a percentage. And you would say the mobile phone is 500 of 2,500, therefore 20 percent. And the airtime is 80 percent, 2,000 over 2,500 if we look at standalone selling prices. Therefore, if we go to step three, the transaction price is 2400 If we allocate 20% of that to the mobile phone, it's the 480 And the rest, uh, the 80% of 2400 uh, would go to uh, the airtime or the downloads. And then in step five, finally, we get to recognize revenue. You recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. So as soon as I receive my mobile phone, Telstra can recognize $480 of revenue because they've performed their promised or they've 
honoured their promise. They've given me the mobile phone. I've taken ownership. Off I go. They've allocated 480 of the transaction price to that mobile phone and they can recognise that revenue. The remainder, the 1,920, will be spread over the 24 months. It will be spread over time as I use um, the airtime and the downloads. So that's a, a quick and a simple example uh, to apply the core principle in the five steps. Now, let's look at each step individually. Uh, in step one, to identify the contracts with the customer, uh, there are four things to consider. The first of all is, do we have the rights to the goods or services or, or are the rights to goods and services identified? Are the payment terms identified? So when will we pay? $100 every month for the next 24 months. Um, the second thing is it approved and the parties are committed to their obligations? So if it has to be approved by shareholders or board of directors, whoever has it been approved, are they committed to their obligations? And so I have to make an assessment, judgment call, whether they are committed, committed to the obligations. The third one, uh, does this transaction or this contract have commercial substance? So it has to make commercial sense. Um, it's not just something written on a piece of paper to achieve a certain outcome. It's got commercial substance. And then the fourth one, which um, could be a bit problematic, is in step one, before we even decide that we've got a contract or not, we have to consider whether collection of the consideration is probable. So right up front, um, if I don't think I'll be able to collect this money from this customer, I don't have a contract, end of story. And there won't be revenue recognition. Um, therefore, one would imagine that clients hopefully have a process where they do credit checking of customers, um, some kind of assessment whether we should sell to the customer or not, um, whether they'll be able to pay us or not. Um, some kind of process, but you can see it's judgment. There's a lot of judgment required when we apply the new ASB 15. So we look at whether this consideration, the collection of consideration is probable. So you would say, why did they put this in? And the reason is they don't want us to recognize revenue and then just a few months later have a big impairment loss on the receivable. Um, revenue should not be recognized if we don't think it's probable that we'll actually receive that money. So therefore there's no recognition, revenue recognition to start with. And probable is the meaning that we usually use and that is more than 50% likely, more likely than not. Um, so is it probable? I think what's interesting here is that in the second bullet point, entities should consider the customer's ability and intention, which includes assessing its ability to pay the amount of consideration when it is due. So not only ability, but their intention to pay. And we've discussed the why. So still part of step one, if we've got a contract and we think we've got a contract, we still have to consider whether we should group or bundle these contracts together and treat it as one contract or not. So remember we said put everything on the table, all the contracts with the customer on the table, and now we decide whether we should bundle them together for revenue recognition purposes or not. So we will bundle them together and treat them the same if it's entered into more or less at the same time. It's with the same customer. Now there you have to consider same customer or related parties. So it's not the exact same name. It could be related parties, other entities within the group, trusts, etc. Um, and they are accounted for as a single contract if you also meet one of the following criteria. So the contract are negotiated as a package with a single commercial objective or the amount of consideration in one contract depends on the price or performance of another contract. Um, or the goods or services that are promised in the contracts, or some of the goods or services represent a single performance obligation. So it's really three things, same time, same customer, and one of these three things 
and then we would group it together as a single contract. So first of all, everything on the table, which of them should be gr um, grouped together as a single contract? That's step one only, a lot of judgment already. Now we go on to step two. In step two, once we've got a single contract, we now have to identify the separate performance obligations. Now, a separate a performance obligation is a promise to a customer to transfer a good or service or a bundle of goods or services that is distinct. And a series of distinct goods or services that are substantially the same and that have the same pattern of transfer to the customer. So it's either the distinct or it's a series of distinct goods and services. So we ask the question, is the good or service distinct? If we say yes, then it's a separate performance obligation. If we say no, we combine it with other goods and services or other promised goods and services until we get a distinct good or service. Um, so to have a distinct good or service is a key issue. How do we know whether a good or service is distinct or not? So there's a two-part uh, threshold or two hurdles. Um, the first one is, can the customer benefit from the good or service, whether on its own or with other readily available resources? Um, so in my example, can I use a mobile phone on its own? Absolutely, because I can also get airtime through Optus. Can I use airtime on its own? Absolutely, I can continue to use my old iPhone 4 with the new airtime, not a problem. So can we use it on its own or with other readily available resources? If we say yes, we go to the second hurdle. If we say no, the good or service is not distinct, end of, end of story. And then we'll have to look for other similar goods or services until we have something that is distinct. So let's go back. If we've said yes, then the next question is, is the promise to transfer a good or service separate from other promised goods or services in the contract? If we say yes, it's separate from other promises, then it's a distinct good or service. If we say no, then we'll bundle it with those other goods and services until we've got a series or a bundle of goods or services that's distinct. To me, it reminds me a little bit of impairment testing for cash generating units. If an individual asset has its own cash flows, you do impairment testing of that asset. If not, you group it with other assets until you get to a group of assets that have their own distinct cash flows. And then you do impairment testing at that, at that cash generating unit. Um, so how do we know whether a promise to transfer a good or service is separate from other promises? We look at three things. First of all, um, it would uh, not be separate. If the entity does not provide a significant service of integrating the goods or service, um, the good or service that does not modify uh, or customize the goods or services, or the good or service is not highly dependent on or interrelated with other goods or services. So an example, if you're selling a good, but you also have to install it, test it, um, then it's one a distinct good or service altogether. It's not separate on its own. So in step one, we put all the contracts together. We determine, do we have a contract? Should we bundle them together or not? In step two, we now separate out the different promises, the distinct promises, the distinct performance obligations. In step three, we determine the transaction price. Now, the transaction price is the amount of consideration to which an entity expects to be entitled in exchange for transferring goods or services to a customer. So it's what the entity expects to receive. And this is a key change. What do we expect to receive? So when we look at a transaction price, we consider a number of things. So we consider variable consideration and the constraint. And I'll explain that in a second. 
we consider whether we have to pay uh, consideration to a customer in certain conditions like penalties. Uh, we consider whether there is a significant financing component. So that would be a situation where the timing of the revenue recognition and the actual cash flow is more than 20 months apart. Um, because in that case, there could be a interest expense or there could be an interest income. So if we receive the cash, but we only do the revenue recognition later on, uh, there could be interest income because they're financing us. The other way around, if we sell something to a customer and the customer only pays us in two years time, over the two years we are financing them, uh, sorry, in that over the two years we are financing them and there would be interest income. The other way around, they are financing us, there would be an interest expense. So if we receive a cash deposit, and we build a building, and at the end of five years, we recognize a revenue. Over those five years, the customer have actually financed us, and every year there should be an interest expense. And if there's non-cash consideration, it should be fair valued. So all of that would impact the determination of the transaction price. I've skipped the first one, and that is variable consideration and the constraint. So what do we mean by that? Now, variable consideration would be uh, discounts or rebates, as an example. So at the moment, you sell something to a customer and the invoice price is a million dollars. However, it's your business practice that if the customer pay you within 30 days, they get a $20,000 uh, discount. Question is, what amount of consideration do the entity expect in that transaction? Do we expect to receive the invoice amount of a million dollars or do we expect to only receive $980,000? And this is a judgment call based on past experience. If this customer always pays within 30 days, therefore we would expect to only receive $980,000 our revenue recognition would only be $980,000. So that is variable consideration. The constraint that they're talking about is you'll only take that potential discount, the $20,000 discount into account if it's highly probable that the client or the customer will pay you within the 30 days. So not just probable, more likely than not, it has to be highly probable. That's the constraint. You only take that variability into account if it's highly probable. So if you look at this diagram, is the consideration variable? So is there a potential rebate, discount, etc.? If we say yes, we estimate the amount using the expected value or most likely value. So what is the amount? So the 20 grand. And then we determine the portion, if any, of that amount for which it is highly probable that a significant revenue reversal will not subsequently occur. So it has to be highly probable. And only then do we take it into consideration to determine our transaction price of 980. A practical application of this is uh, in a situation where you use a distributor for your inventory. So if entity A sell goods to entity B, a distributor on their behalf, and the distributors sell the inventory to customers. Currently, um, because the distributor entity B is an agent, currently we would say entity A would only recognize revenue from the sale of the goods once entity B, the distributor sold the goods to the customers. However, if you apply this principle um, in AASB 15 and you argue that it's highly probable that the distributor, based on past experience, will sell 90% of those goods to a customer and it's highly probable that they'll only return 10% of those consignment stock to you, Entity A. That means Entity A can recognize revenue, 90% of the revenue, at the date that they transfer or provide the stock to the distributor. 
So that would actually bring revenue recognition earlier. Uh, step four is to allocate the transaction price. So we allocate the transaction price uh, as far as possible on the standalone selling price. And we have to look at the best evidence of the standalone selling price. Um, and this is, uh, you know, the kind of hierarchy similar to a fair value hi hierarchy. We start with, can we look at a market price? If not, is there an adjusted market assessment? If not, we can even use expected cost plus a, plus a margin approach. And in very limited circumstances, can we use a residual approach? A residual approach is kind of a lazy approach. That's where I would have said my transaction price for my mobile phone is 2400 It's easy to determine that the market price of my mobile phone on its own is 500 Therefore, the residual 1,900 I allocate to the airtime. So they say we shouldn't do that, only in limited circumstances. We should first try to look at market price. That's where we look at the mobile phone, market price 500, airtime market price 2,000, um, and allocate it on the 20%, 80% basis. And step five is that we recognize revenue when a performance obligation is satisfied. So an entity recognizes revenue when or as it satisfies its performance obligation by transferring control of a good or a service to a customer. So that control could be transferred at a point in time or over time. So question is, does the entity transfer control over time? If you say yes, we recognize the revenue over time. If we say no, we recognize the revenue at a point in time. So when would we recognize or when would we transfer control over time and therefore recognize revenue over time? Only three situations. First of all, where the customer simultaneously receives and consumes the benefits. So that would be services. Or number two, the entity's performance creates or enhances an asset that the customer controls as the asset is created or enhanced. So if I own a block of land and a construction company build a building on my land, uh, they can recognize the revenue over time because they are constructing a building on my land that I control. So they transfer in control to me over time. They can recognize revenue over time. Um, or the third one, if an entity's performance does not create an asset with an alternative use. So if we are building an asset for a client that can only be used by that client and it's got no alternative use, I can recognize revenue over time. How do we know whether controls passed? We look at whether there's a present obligation to pay. To pay. We look at physical possession, legal title, the risk and rewards of ownership, and whether the customer has accepted the client. We look at all of this in combination um, and, uh, and exercise our judgment whether control has passed. So what is the effective date of AASB 15 currently for annual periods beginning on or after 1 January 2017? So that would mean 30 June 2018. Early adoption is permitted. However, internationally and in the U.S., um, they've postponed application to 1 January 2018, which would mean 30 June 2019 year ends for us in Australia. So we've got a number of years to get ready for this. Um, the devil is in the detail. 347 pages of examples, implementation guidance to work through. Um, so the whole idea of including it in the webinar is to start the discussion early. Um, implications for 30 June. Remember, we have to disclose it as part of accounting standards issued, but not yet effective. It's a double ASB 108 requirement to disclose that. And remember, it's also an ASIC focus area. If you're a not-for-profit entity, I want to briefly touch on not-for-profits. I don't have that much time, about six minutes left, so I can't go into too much detail. Um, but, but I do want to look at not-for-profits. There's an ED out, so it's not a standard yet, but I do want to consider um, the not-for-profit implications as well. Um, as we all know, AASB 1004 contribution, 
contributions is problematic. There's a lot of interpretive issues around it. Um, there's a lot of divergence in practice. Um, and for about 15 years, the ISB has grappled with this. Um, now they've issued ED260 um, to replace ultimately ISB1004 and to try and use uh, the principles contained in the new ISB15 and apply it to not-for-profits. Um, so there will be an Appendix E to ISB15 to discuss how ISB15 applies to not-for-profits, which is very similar to the Appendix E to ISB10 on how that uh, do the new definition of control apply to not-for-profits. The high-level proposals are that ISB15 should apply to all contracts with customers that are entered into by a not-for-profit entity. So if a not-for-profit enter into a contract with a customer, you apply ISB 15. Um, and, um, and also, so that's the high level. And then it removes a requirement to determine whether transactions are reciprocal or non-reciprocal, which was a, an area of debate in the current ISB 1004. Um, so a decision tree. Um, so this is high level, and, and this is to decide whether ISB 15 applies or whether the replacement standard will apply. Because your first decision as a not-for-profit will be, should I apply ISB 15 or do I apply the not-for-profit specific standard? So the decision tree, the first thing is, does the transaction occur in a contract? Or put a different way, does the transaction occur in an agreement with another party that creates enforceable rights and obligations. And if you say yes, the second question, and this is crucial, does this contract or this agreement include performance obligations? So if you've got a contract, but it doesn't have specific performance obligations, then you are still in the replacement not-for-profit standard, double ASB 10, whatever the number will be. You'll only apply double ASB 15 as a not-for-profit if the transaction is um, entered into in an agreement with a customer and there are um, sufficiently specific performance obligations. Um, so if the transactions are outside the scope of ISB 15, uh, the revenue should recognize, be recognized within the entity obtains control of the asset. Now that obtains control of the asset is also currently in ISB 1004. However, this ED proposes more explanatory materials around, uh, you know, what do we understand under control of an asset? So when does the entity obtain control of an asset? Um, first of all, it could be when they can direct the use of the asset or uh, when they obtain substantially all of the remaining benefits from the asset or if they've got the ability to deny or regulate access of others to the asset. Um, contrain, they say control would be obtained on receipt in many circumstances. Uh, because remember, if you had a contract and if there were, were performance obligations, you would have been applying ASB 15 in the first place. You are applying this standard if there's no contract or if there's a contract and there's no performance obligations. And therefore, usually, you'll obtain control when you receive um, the, the money or receive, receive the asset. Um, they say control may be obtained prior to receipt if the promise or, uh, of the transfer is legally enforceable at an earlier date. So quiz question three, before we finish off this webinar, I've got a, a one or two minutes left. So who is the media mogul James Backer currently dating and rumoured to be engaged to? Big news. I love her music. One of the top selling artists of all time. Any ideas? Come on, this is easier than double A's B15, I reckon. Everyone's a hero. I like that answer, Daniel. 
Great one. Yes, absolutely. Mariah Carey. Absolutely. I love her music. Everyone's a hero. Um, the last two sections I'll touch on very briefly in my remaining minute. There's a new AASB9 financial instruments. Um, currently, we have AASB 139, 132, AASB 7, which is a complex set of accounting standards. The big problem child in the current set of standards is available for sale financial assets, uh, which is one of the four categories, uh, and, and specifically the impairment of available for sale financial assets is problematic because um, an impairment loss will go through profit and loss if there's a crash in the market. But if the market recover, that increase will not go through profit and loss, but will go to a revaluation reserve again. And that was a big problem during the global financial crisis. And therefore, the new AASB9 only has three categories of financial assets. It's got financial assets at amortized cost, like debtors, uh, receivables, loans. Um, it's got financial assets at fair value through profit and loss, and that is the preferred alternative. Um, all financial assets at fair value, and if there's a change in fair value, we put it through profit and loss, although that could lead to a bit of volatility. And then the third category is to fix the problem, and it's equity investments, so only equity investments. Uh, it's designated at fair value through other comprehensive income, so it goes through the reserves. It's designated there. You cannot um, change your designation. You do it on an asset-by-asset -asset basis, and ups and downs, profits and losses, sit in other comprehensive income forever and ever. So if you're looking for a decision tree on how do we account for financial assets, if it's a derivative, in the middle, very easy, it's fair value for profit and loss. If we look at equity, if it's an investment, an equity investment in shares, etc., your first question is, is it held for trading? If you say yes, held for trading, it's fair value for profit and loss. If you say no, we keep it for a longer per term perspective, you have a fair value through other comprehensive income option. And if it goes through other comprehensive income, profits and losses go through the revaluation reserve. Um, but it's an irrevocable election you make on an asset-by-asset -asset basis. If you don't want to do that, it's fair value through profit and loss. If you go on the other side of the diagram, if you've got a financial asset that's a debt instrument, uh, you do the business model test first of all. So business model test. Um, do I have this debt instrument with the intention to receive cash flows going forward? If that's my sole intention with this instrument, I say yes. I say, what is the characteristics of this financial asset? Am I only going to receive the repayment of my capital investment and interest? If I say yes, um, I've got the fair value option. You can always use fair value. I say, no, I don't want to use the fair value option. Then you can use amortized cost. Um, if we said, listen, my business model test, um, I've got another reason for keeping it. It's not just for future cash flows. I want to speculate that it's fair value through profit and loss. Or if you said, I'm only interested in cash flows, but my cash flows is not only capital or interest, it's fair value for profit and loss. So this is at a big picture level how the financial assets change. Financial instruments, there's also new hedging requirements and new requirements around impairment testing, um, which we'll look at at a future stage. Leases project, I think the key thing, um, we're expecting the standard towards the end of the year. I would expect an application date not earlier than 30 June 2019. All leases will be accounted for as finance leases, or all leases will be accounted for the same way and the way we currently account for finance leases. There will be an asset and there will be, on day one, there will be an asset and a liability. And then going forward, there will be a depreciation of the asset over its useful life. And if it's a liability, there will be an interest expense on the liability. Um, if you currently have 
an operating lease of a building, you currently have an even operating lease expense over the five years of the lease. The new lease standard um, will change that because on day one, you'll have an asset and liability with the same value. So that's not the problem. The problem is over the five years, you will depreciate that right to use the building evenly over the five years um, because we depreciate an asset evenly over, over its useful life. However, the liability um, or the interest on the liability will be very high in year one and will be at its lowest in year five because as we repay the, the lease installments, we are repaying the loan. Therefore, the interest expense goes from high to low. Uh, therefore, if you currently have operating leases, you would be used to an even expense in your profit and loss. Going forward, um, in the first year that you enter into a lease, the expense will be high and will taper down over the period of the lease. And that is because depreciation will stay the same, but interest will decrease as you repay the loan. So that's something to think about, about leases. Listen, I've run out of time. Thank you very much for, for joining me today. We will look at ASB 9 again. We will look at ASB 15 again. Obviously, for not-for-profits, we'll consider the standard replacing ASB 1004. And as soon as we've got the actual final leases standard, we will look at this. I just wanted to give you a flavor of all the new things that are coming or that's already there. For 30 June 2015, uh, sections 1, 2, and 3 are important. Uh, if we look a little bit at the future, sections 4 to 8. Please contact me if you've got any questions or comments. Thank you for joining me. Um, good luck with preparing your financial statements to get it done by end of September if you are listed or our other clients by end of October. To the auditors, good luck with busy season. Please come and speak to John and I with any questions. Um, and, and, and good luck, and we'll resume our webinars in November. Thank you.